Good morning, everyone. You can join me in opening your Bibles to Leviticus chapter 25. Uh, We're nearing the end of our series through Leviticus, and this is on page 103 in the Bibles that are uh, nearby and under chairs uh, nearby you. Let's uh, read a portion of this text and pray together uh, before we begin. So Leviticus 25, beginning in verse 8. You shall count seven weeks of years, seven times seven years, so that the time of the seven weeks of years you shall, give, shall give you forty-nine years. Then you shall sound the loud trumpet on the tenth day of the seventh month. On the day of atonement, you shall sound the trumpet throughout all your land, and you shall consecrate the fiftieth year and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants." It shall be a jubilee for you, when each of you shall return to his property, and each of you shall return to his clan. That fiftieth year shall be a jubilee for you. In it you shall neither sow nor reap what grows of itself, nor gather the grapes from the undressed vines, for it is a jubilee. It shall be holy to you. You may eat the produce of the field. In this year of jubilee, each of you shall take or shall return to his property. And if you make a sale to your neighbor or buy from your neighbor, you shall not wrong one another. You shall pay your neighbor according to the number of years after the jubilee, and he shall sell to you according to the number of years for crops. If the years are many, you shall increase the price. If the years are few, you shall reduce the price, for it is the number of crops that he's selling you. You shall not wrong one another, but you shall fear your God, for I am the Lord your God. Therefore you shall do my statutes and keep my rules and perform them, and then you will dwell in the land securely. The land will yield its fruit and you will eat your fill and dwell in it securely. And if you say, what shall we eat in the seventh year? If we may not sow or gather in our crop, I will command my blessing on you in the sixth year so that it will produce a crop sufficient for three years. When you sow in the eighth year, you will be eating some of the old crop. You shall eat the old until the ninth year when its crop arrives. The land shall not be sold in perpetuity, for the land is mine. For you are strangers and sojourners with me. And in all the country you possess, you shall allow a redemption of the land. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the book of Leviticus. In many ways, a very strange-sounding book to us now thousands of years after you first gave it to your people. But we uh, trust and are seeing evidence through this series that your word is living and active and powerful and relevant for all of life and especially to give us wisdom for seeing your grace and salvation through Jesus. So we pray now as we consider this jubilee idea in this text that you would help us to see and understand more of your goodness, the glory of Jesus. And we pray this in the name of Jesus and by the Spirit. Amen. Well, we all want a society that values freedom and equality and justice. We want to see oppression end. We want to see those in poverty supported. And these desires are good in principle. They're actually deeply Christian desires. But most of history is failed with the failures to pursue these or live them out. So some societies have not valued these at all. Others have valued them in part or for only some, but they haven't applied them to everyone in their land. Or we haven't been able to live them out consistently, which has been our story as a nation. Many movements pursue equity and end up with oppression. Many seek justice, and they use unjust means to pursue it. And then enough time goes on, and you find out the leaders of this justice movement were corrupt the whole time. So what's the solution? Where will we find a society and a leader who will bring it? Well, do you know how Jesus began his ministry? Do you know what he said? He went into a synagogue. Luke 4 describes this. He went into a synagogue and led the scripture reading. They handed him the scroll of Isaiah. So he took the scroll and he opened it up to Isaiah 61. And then he read it aloud and he handed the scroll back. And he sat down, and everyone looked at him, and what did he say? What did it say? 
Well, he said after he read it, this scripture is fulfilled today in your hearing. It, like within minutes, several people there wanted to kill him because how radical it was for him to say that about what he read. So what did he read? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty, freedom to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So Jesus announced that he came to be the one person in human history, this God-man Jesus, to bring the good news of freedom and restoration. He is the one who can bring this to the world, and he has. In fact, one of the reasons our culture values freedom, equality, justice so deeply is because of the influence of that man in history and in Western cultures. So what does he mean here? What does this kind of world look like that he is bringing? Well, Jesus quoted from Isaiah here, but Isaiah was drawing on an even more ancient idea and text. He was drawing on the text that we read just a few minutes ago, Leviticus 25. So if you want to understand Jesus and the restoration that he brings, then Leviticus 25 is a surprisingly relevant text. So Leviticus 25 can help us understand Jesus and the kind of freedom and restoration that he is bringing into the world and one day will bring in its fullness. So the message of Leviticus 25 is summarized with a word that we may not be very familiar with and we certainly don't use in everyday uh, conversations, and that word is jubilee. Jubilee is about God creating a community of forgiveness and freedom and generosity. So here's what Jubilee was. It was one year in 50 when Israel was to experience a total economic reset. It would allow Israelites who lost their land or lost a measure of freedom and potential for wealth creation to regain it. And this chapter is filled with various ways that Israel was to care for the poor among them. So this chapter gave Israel vision for how to live in a society of freedom and blessing and justice. So this text is not here for us today to apply in a direct way. Some have tried to do that. There was in uh, 1999 and 2000 a movement called Jubilee 2000 where people try to pull on this text to apply it to have certain nations cancel the debt of other nations. There may be some wisdom that we can uh, grab by doing something like that. But So there, this text has been an inspiration for certain movements, but we need to take the whole text seriously and see how it, it works in the whole Bible and points to Jesus and then us today. So this was for ancient Israel in the context of the whole structure of Leviticus. So we can't just kind of remove this text and then try to implement it in a modern nation today. But there are deep principles here, and this text pointed forward to Jesus and what he would come to do and bring for us. So I want to argue that this text is very relevant for us today. The message of this text for God's people is this. We are to work for others to experience restoration and freedom and justice through Jesus. That's the message of this text for God's people. We are to work to, for others to experience restoration, freedom, and justice through Jesus. So because Jesus restores us, we want to see Jesus bring restoration, full holistic restoration to others. So we'll read various parts of the chapter as we walk through it, and we'll see four realities of Jubilee. We'll see the reset of Jubilee, the compassion of Jubilee, the story of Jubilee, and its relevance. So first, the reset of Jubilee. So the one way to think about what Jubilee was, was it was a reset year, a super Sabbath year. So here's what it means. Israel had a pattern of Sabbath rest built into their calendar according to the number seven. So Sabbath was a day of rest on the seventh day of every week. And then this chapter at the beginning introduces a Sabbath year every seventh year. So Israel wouldn't work the land on the seventh year they were led to rest for the seventh year, so they, they couldn't plant or harvest on it at all during that year. 
It had a practical purpose. It's good for the land. We know that soil can become depleted. That's why there's crop rotation and fertilizer. Also had a bigger purpose, though. It was an opportunity for Israel to trust the Lord, to trust God to provide for them. It was an exercise of faith. So that's the Sabbath year. Then they also had this Jubilee year, which was a super Sabbath year. They had the Sabbath after seven years, but then after seven sets of seven years, they would have this super Sabbath. So after 49 years in the 50th, they would experience a total economic and social reset. So this is verses 8 to 12. We read this at the beginning, but let me just point out a few things here. Notice in verse 9, it was proclaimed on the Day of Atonement. So it says, you shall sound the trumpet on the tenth day of the seventh month, on the Day of Atonement. You shall sound the trumpet throughout your land. So this is the day that the high priest would sacrifice for the sins of the people. One goat would be sacrificed for the sins. Another goat would be sent out, banished from the the land of Israel into the wilderness as a picture of our sins being removed and that goat taking our banishment from God's presence. So it was a spiritual reset for Israel every year. And then in that 49th year, there's a trumpet blast that announced it. So think of the trumpet blast kind of like, you know, our yearly watching the the New Year's ball drop in New York. When that drops, it's time for the reset, right? It's a new year. So for them, when you hear this trumpet blast in the 49th year, it's a reset. It signals the start of this time. Verse 10 shows us the meaning of it. It's a proclamation of freedom through the land. Do you know that that verse, verse 10, is written on the Liberty Bell? In the King James, proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereto. So this is deep in our history as a nation. I mentioned earlier, of course, we've been very inconsistent as a nation in applying that, which is why in the 1800s, Um, Many of the abolitionists would use the Liberty Bell and point to that saying, let's be true to our convictions because we've not had liberty across this land for everyone in its time. So when Israel entered the land, God gave each clan a plot of land, but over the years, people would sell their land and move away. So now every 50th year, everyone returns to their plot of land. They regain that. They regather with their extended families. So it was a, a total reset. Then the rest of the chapter works out the implications of this, especially for the poor. So in verses 13 to 17, we see the implications of this for selling land. And the principle is this, you only buy and sell land according to the time left in the Jubilee. So you only sell temporarily. Really, all land sales and property sales then throughout Israel, it was more like leases. So you could lease out your land if you needed to, But you had to calculate how many years were left until the next Jubilee when you'd get it back. So if the Jubilee's 30 years away, you're leasing your land for 30 years to somebody. If there's one year left, then you just lease it for one year. And the cost is calculated accordingly. Then you get it back at the Jubilee. The theological reason for this is in verse 23. It's the most important verse in the chapter. The land shall not be sold in perpetuity, for the land is mine. God says, for you are strangers and sojourners with me. That's actually pretty striking. So this was looking forward to Israel when they entered the land and God gave it to them. And he's saying, never forget, this land is not actually yours. It's mine. You're sojourning now in the wilderness. You're going to be sojourning in the land. It's my land. Uh, You're my servants and your sojourners with me. So the promised land is not ultimately anyone's, even Israel's, it's God's, and he retains ownership of it even when Israel lived there. So Israel was never to view their land as theirs in an ultimate sense, but God's. This is why they don't have the right here to sell their land to anyone else in perpetuity. And this also means they needed to continue to trust and obey God in order to stay in the land. That was always the condition from the beginning for their ability to live in the land under God's blessing. They didn't have an eternal or unconditional right to the land. It was always God's. He lets them live in it so long as there is faithful people. So they're tenants, not owners. Uh, Side note, this has some implications for how we view the land of Israel today. Um, it It was always conditioned upon them being God's faithful people. 
And so, um, whatever we think of people's right to a plot of land according to various principles and history and the way that nations and nation states uh, view ownership of the land, we don't go to the Old Testament and say, see, it's theirs, because this was for a faithful believing people and pre-Jesus. Jesus Jesus has now come and all sorts of fulfillment have come in Him. Um, I sent a midweek out in the past. I can send some more resources. We're not going to get into that now, but it's important to just see this all through the Bible. Um, how to understand the land and Israel's place in it. And so for this text, though, the key is that every, every Israelite has a plot of land that's theirs, but not in an ultimate sense. And there's implications then for how it's sold. Now, why is this so important? Why institute then a 50-year reset? It was for the sake of the poor. The rest of the chapter shows how Israel was to care for the poor among them. So second, the compassion of Jubilee. It was a reset for people when they fell into poverty. Everyone would get their land back. They were restored to their families. They were free from their debts and servitude. They can now produce wealth again, produce from their land. So what happens when people have their land back, even after the Jubilee? Everything's reset for them, but then over time, maybe in the next few years, 10 years, 20 years, they sink into poverty. And they have to sell the land away. How are they cared for in the meantime? This text walks through four stages of poverty and how Israel was to care for them. So stage one is when someone becomes poor and therefore they sell part of their land. And this is verses 25 to 28. If your brother becomes poor and sells part of his property, then his nearest redeemer, so a redeemer is someone who buys it back, buys something for them, the nearest redeemer shall come and redeem what his brother sold. Verse 26, if a man has no one to redeem it, and then himself becomes prosperous and finds sufficient means to redeem it, let him calculate the years since he sold it and pay back the balance to the man to whom he sold it, and then return to his property. But if he doesn't have sufficient means to recover it, then what is sold shall remain in the hand of the buyer until the year of Jubilee. In the Jubilee, it shall be released and he shall return to his proper property. So if someone becomes poor, they can sell some of their property. But if he has to sell it, the goal is always for him to get it back. And there's several ways this can happen. First, a close family member can act as a redeemer, which means they would buy the land back. If he has no one who will do this, he himself can raise money in the meantime and get out of poverty, and so then he can buy the land back himself. What if he can't do that? Well, then at the very least... He waits until the next Jubilee, which doesn't mean he has to wait 50 years. This probably didn't happen just like year one after the Jubilee. So maybe he had 10 years left, maybe five, maybe 20, but he's going to get it back at some point. It will continue through the generations then. So the text then gives some exceptions to the rule for houses in walled cities and for Levites. The second stage of poverty is verses 35 to 38. So what if someone became so poor that they sold all their poverty or property? How is Israel to help this family? Well, you can read it with me. If your brother becomes poor and cannot maintain himself with you, you shall support him as though he were a stranger and a sojourner, and he shall live with you. Take no interest from him or profit, but fear your God, that your brother may live beside you. By the way, that note, fear your God, shows up a few times in this chapter when it's dealing with a situation where someone is uniquely vulnerable inserts that motive. You fear the Lord here. You care for this person. They're vulnerable among you so that that he may live beside you. Verse 37, you shall not lend him your money at interest, nor give him food for profit. I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt to give you the land of Canaan and to be your God. So the instructions here is to support him with compassion and justice. You can lend to him, but don't take advantage of him. Don't charge interest. You can sell him things, but don't make a profit. Of course, you can lend with interest and make profit. In in general, there's certain situations where God allows that in Israel. But for someone in poverty like this, you treat the person well because they're in a tough situation. In other words, this bans the kind of scams that target the poor. It bans targeting the poor with high interest loans. As a side note, if you ever get an email purportedly from Pastor Drew looking for you to buy iTunes gift cards immediately... Um, As I know many of you have many times over the years, please disregard that. I will never be asking you for iTunes gift cards. I'm not even sure how that would cash out, but apparently the scammers know. 
So this bans targeting the poor with high interest loans. One scholar notes this envisions a poor man living with you. So you buy his land, but you don't evict him. You give him room and board. He can work to pay off his debts, allows him to plant crops, make a harvest, pay off debt, save money to pay off loans. The third stage of poverty is complete destitution. This family can't even sell their property to cover their debts. So what do they do? Well, they can hire themselves out as servants. This is verses 39 to 43. If your brother becomes poor beside you and sells himself to you, you shall not make him serve as a slave. He shall be with you as a hired worker and as a sojourner. He shall serve with you until the year of Jubilee. Then he shall go out from you, he and his children with him, and go back to his own clan and return to the possession of his fathers. For they are my servants, whom I brought out of the land of Egypt. They shall not be sold as slaves. You shall not rule over him ruthlessly, but shall fear your God. There's that note again. Particularly vulnerable person, you fear God. You revere God and his word here. All right, so this is a last-ditch effort for survival. This guy becomes a hired servant until the next jubilee year, and then he goes free and returns to his land. So this is a kind of slavery, but the word slavery isn't the best one for it. It's not anything like what we think of now when we think of the word slavery. These servants still had all sorts of protections and rights, and they go free in the jubilee year. The next verses clarify that Israel can only have uh, permanent servants from other nations, so the word's often even there translated slave, but it's not quite, again, what we think of when we think of as slavery. I think it's best to translate it as permanent servant. So they still had protections and rights here. Kidnapping, man-stealing was forbidden as a capital offense. Certainly should have had relevance to anyone who was trying to think the Bible uh, would endorse any kind of slavery that we've uh, seen in recent histories here. They, if they were severely beaten, they could go free without penalty and without return to their master. They're also treated as part of the household. They participate in the Sabbaths and feasts. They're still viewed as made in God's image, and God's ultimate purpose is to bless the nations. So we don't have time to go further into this. It's not the, the point of this text, but I wanted to share a few of those things because it's just helpful as we come across notes about servitude or slavery in the Bible. I'm happy to give you resources if you think it'd be um, helpful for you to think through it, uh, but this was a massive difference and improvement upon how slavery was practiced in the ancient world. And then in the New Testament, there are principles there for its eventual undoing um, in the world. And it has, uh, the Bible has been the, the primary source text used for the abolition of slavery globally. Now, the fourth stage of poverty is actually a step beyond this. Here, an Israelite is so destitute that he can't even hire himself out to another Israelite, he, has to, he finds himself in a situation where he hires himself to a wealthy foreigner who's living among them. So in this situation, another Israelite can redeem him and buy him out of this. At the very least, he'll be set free in the Jubilee. So here's what this shows us. God's heart is to make sure that in this new society he's creating, this light to the nations in Israel, that poverty was limited and temporary. It prevented the wealthy from taking advantage of the poor by collecting land and property over the years and, and then pushing the poor out and then enslaving them. And notice the commands here are not directed to the poor in this text. They're directed to the wealthy. They have a responsibility to see this done. The assumption of this chapter is that if you are wealthy among Israel, you're wealthy in general as a principle, you have a responsibility. If you have wealth and power and influence, you're to use it to help others. So wealth and power are not viewed as, you know, privileges to be ashamed of, which is what some people seem to think today, but their responsibilities were to use privileges to care for the underprivileges. And the wealthy are called upon to see to it that this happens. So now how do we connect with this today? Well, before we get there, we have to see that the whole Bible tells a Jubilee story. This has been the key throughout this series in Leviticus. Leviticus can seem confusing and irrelevant at first, but when we see how it fits in the big story of the Bible, we see how it relates to us, and that's the primary way that we have to understand the book of Leviticus. It will remain irrelevant, boring, or just randomly applied um, unless we see where this fits in the story of the Bible. So there's, there's a drama of five scenes in this Jubilee story. Creation, Exodus, Jesus, the church, new creation. So really briefly, creation. 
The number seven is all over this text. Seven days, seven years, seven sevens of years. And then the Jubilee is this super Sabbath day of rest, all echoing for Israel the creation week in Genesis 1 and 2. And then that seventh day of rest. And then picture what the Sabbath year was like. The land is providing food abundantly. The people are feasting on it in a way that we would imagine Adam and Eve and their descendants, if they hadn't fallen, would be feasting on the land in the beginning. And in the Jubilee year then, they would have lived a bit like how the world was always meant to be lived in Eden. So they're like reliving in this creation week, in that 50th year. Second, Exodus. At the Exodus, God forgave Israel's sins through the Passover lamb, and He brought them out of their slavery and oppression under Pharaoh in Egypt. So he's delivering them and forgiving them, and then he gives them the land as an inheritance. Now, in the Jubilee year, they're really reenacting that Exodus redemption. They get a complete reset to their original redemption. So, as they experience this, they're supposed to be thinking, this is like Eden again, and this is like the beginning of the Exodus redemption again. Their sins are forgiven on the Day of Atonement, right? Trumpets blasting on that day. Forgiveness is here, and it's a reset, just like it was for them when they came out of Egypt. And then those who have debts, they're canceled. Those who are in servitude are set free. You're restored to your families. You're restored to your properties. You go back to how it was right at the beginning. Third step in the story is Jesus. So as they're thinking backward to creation and backward to Exodus, they're looking forward over time. You know, it's sad that there's no evidence that Israel actually practiced the Jubilee year. Um, Maybe they did, but it's not because it wasn't practical. It's because it required faith, especially among those who had wealth and power. It required them to trust the Lord, to embrace God's generosity to them, to recognize the things they had are not theirs but God's, and then to obey God and give generously. And so, they were eventually sent out of the land, and then the prophet Isaiah promised that there would be a greater jubilee to come. It wouldn't just be that Israel's back in the land and they get to do this now. No, there's going to be a deeper, fuller, truer jubilee that would happen. It would be a radical restoration even greater than the original jubilee. In Isaiah 61, we have the promise of someone who will come who will bring this greater year of redemption and freedom. It'll be called the year of the Lord's favor. We read it already at the beginning. I'll I'll read it again. It says this, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prisons to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort, excuse me, all who mourn. So that's how Jesus began his ministry, by quoting that text, which draws on Leviticus 25 to say a greater jubilee is coming, a restoration to creation, but better, like the first exodus, but better. And then you just look at Jesus' ministry, and this is what he was doing. He healed people of sickness. He delivered people of demonic oppression. He forgave sins. He set people free from the addictive slavery to self and sin. And then he accomplished this through his death and resurrection. His death was the ultimate day of atonement in which the the ultimate jubilee is proclaimed. He canceled sin and created a reset for everyone who trusts him. When we look at Jesus, we don't see what some see, which is just a justice Jesus. Or he just went around and was only caring for the poor And we need to leave behind this stuff about forgiveness and sin and all that stuff. We need to care about just social concerns and get on board with Jesus. That's what he's about. We don't only see that. We see him forgiving sins, setting free from the addiction to slavery of sin. But we also don't just see spiritual freedom and forgiveness as though Jesus is just spiritualizing the Jubilee promises as if the physical stuff doesn't matter, as if he doesn't really care about the poor and neither should Christians. He does. He cares about both of those things and they're held together with Jesus, which also leads then to the next part, which is the story of the church. Jesus created a, we could call it a jubilee people. Listen to how the early church lived this out in Acts 4. They received this restoration through Jesus, 
Then in Acts 4, it says this, describing the church. There was not a needy person among them. Not because the gospel only went to the wealthy, and therefore the wealthy people became Christians, and of course there weren't needy people. No. For as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of all that was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. So through the church, Jesus is bringing this holistic restoration. The church is a community where forgiveness of sins is found and freedom from the power of sin is found. It's a place of of social and communal inclusion, and it's a place of financial care and provision for one another. The last stage of the story is the new creation. The Bible says that Jesus will return with a trumpet blast, perhaps recalling this jubilee trumpet blast. It announces that the restoration is now going to be complete. The things that Jesus did not bring in his first coming, he will bring in his second in the fullness. So God's people will live again in abundance, forgiven, freed, fulfilled. The physical world itself will be set free from its decay. So that's the Jubilee story of the Bible. So then, what is the relevance for us today in light of all this? A few brief implications. First, experience Jesus' restoration. If you are not yet a Christian and you're wondering, what is the message of Jesus all about? And what would it mean to become a Christian? This is at the heart of it. This is at the heart of the message of Christianity. If you're wondering what it would mean for you to become a Christian, it would mean coming to Jesus for His restoration that He brings, receiving the forgiveness of your sins, receiving a freedom from the power of sin in your life, the addictive enslaving power to selfishness so that you might serve Jesus. You receive His inclusion into a new community of love, community and the fellowship of Father, Son, and Spirit, the God who made you, and the fellowship of His people, local church. And then you participate in giving and receiving financial aid and care. And you receive a promise of a place in the new creation to come. So receive him. Picture the cross of Jesus like the first big trumpet blast of the Jubilee year. And that has been echoing and reverberating for thousands of years, landing on heart after heart after heart as God gives ears to hear that trumpet blast of forgiveness and freedom and hope. May He open your heart today. Second, live generously. This text is about caring for the poor, not because it's, well, the Old Testament was material, but New Testament is physical, so we don't do that. No, it's about caring for the poor because God cares for the poor. He cares for us. Their land was a gift from God. Everything they had was from God. It's His, and He's lending it to us. So, same for for you and me. Your house is not your house. It's God's house. He's lending it to you. Your car, your clothes, your investment portfolio, your assets, they're all His, and He's lending them to you. And you will leave them behind sooner or later, in either a day or 10 years or 60 years from now. God calls you who are wealthy, or when you're wealthy, which is most of us in this room at one time or another, to be generous with what He gives. Israel was to hear on the day of Jubilee the announcement that their sins were forgiven, they're a redeemed people, their God cares for them, and now those who had the power to do something about the situation in the land would then do something about it. They'd give the land back. They'd do the reset because it's God's, and He's been so generous to us, and we do the reset. We hear the same thing. We hear the trumpet blast of the cross. We recognize that everything we have is from God. And so now we're called to look around and think, what what am I to do with what God's given me? Uh, There's no verse in the New Testament or the Old that says, you know, if God's given you a bunch of stuff, it's yours, go ahead and just hoard it. Many, many people don't think they're hoarding. Not many people go around thinking, you know, I'm I'm a hoarder of all my wealth, but, but that is what many of us do. 
And so especially in a nation of wealth like ours, in an area of the nation of wealth like ours, so many of us in this room have a unique responsibility with what God's given us to be radically, creatively generous to others. So third, how do we do this? We'll care for those in need in concentric circles. Here's what I mean. It's not just a general call to care for the poor. In this text and throughout the Bible, there are, you could say, priorities or places to start and go outward from there. So first, this chapter shows that the closest relatives need to step in and help a family member who falls into financial need. It's still the same in the New Testament. Paul says in 1 Timothy 5, to Christians, if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So parents help children. Children help parents, maybe aging parents, if they fall into financial need. Extended family helps relatives. God has created the world with the institution of the family built in as a primary way to care for the poor among people. So when you think of that individually, you can think of that. I mean, that this is wisdom for any nation is upholding families because part of that is what cares for the poor. The second outward circle from there would be the church. If you're a Christian, you're part of a local church, you should be a member of a local church, and that becomes a primary place where you care for people. The wealthy are to care for the poor among them, and then other Christians and churches caring for other believers. And then beyond the church, the next circle would be just others in poverty. The text gives Israel a huge system of principles for economic care. Our modern world is very different, so we can't just replicate Leviticus 25 anymore, but we can see principles that can get traction in our lives and in our relationships and in our culture. So we need Christians to work to create a society where the poor are well cared for. This may mean thinking creatively about creating or sustaining certain government programs. It may mean incentivizing families and communities to be places of care. It may mean restraining government involvement to free up people to care for one another in their local communities. I'm not giving answers here. I'm just encouraging us to work out the principles in whatever sphere of influence you need or you have. And finally, uh, last thought here, proclaim the message of Jubilee, the message of Jesus. Jesus announced that He is the Jubilee, forgiveness, freedom, restorations found in Him, and this is what the world needs. I think so many people that have written off Jesus and His message have not known that it's a message like this, that all the things that everyone longs for in the world, Jesus agrees, he, well, he doesn't agree with everything that everyone longs for, but these deep principles of justice, equality, freedom, care for the poor, this is the heart of God. This is the heart of Jesus, and He has a plan to do something about this, starting by setting us free from our spiritual poverty and giving us the riches of forgiveness and knowing Him, and then freeing us to become people who care for one another, and then ultimately in the new creation, He'll just get the job totally done for His people and bring us completely out of any sense of poverty at all. So bring Jesus' message to the spiritually poor. We live in an area that has a lot of material wealth, a lot of material riches, and a lot of spiritual poverty within those walls of big houses. And they need your friendship, they need our love, and they need the message of Jesus, the jubilee message of Jesus. So let's bring it to them. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your true and good and beautiful word and the way that you call us to live. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for doing for us what we could never do for ourselves and what every society, it seems, is incapable of doing for themselves because of selfishness and pride. So we pray that you'd make us a humble people, embrace our spiritual poverty, receive the riches from you, and live in the way that you call us to. In Jesus' name.